guys. Uh, welcome, bar- work- 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 <laughs> welcome back to part three of this week's Yawa. Um, if you haven't watched part one, two, you're missing out. We have guests and we're guests and it's a circle of guestness. We discussed this earlier. Um, Whitney and Josh with Riverstone Kennels here with us. And we're going to get started right away and see how many questions we can get through for you. Here. Okay. Starting it off with an Instagram question from Carly underscore... Something upbeat. We got a little sappy last time. <laughs> hmm. Okay. <laughs> this isn't sappy, but... Um, so, Carly underscore bigger 22. I've heard a dog can become collar smart to the collar, and I've been told to keep the collar on when the dog isn't in a crate. What's your guys' opinion on this? Also, love you guys and the channel. Aw, thank you. You, mm-hmm. They love you, so you should start this one off. <laughs> Got it. So I am um, a big believer that, yes, dogs can become collar smart, but collar smartness comes from one thing, and that is not... Um, uh, it comes from asking for things that you cannot reinforce or don't reinforce. So, um, Improper use of the collar is part of that. Yeah, but ultimately what it comes down to is if you're asking for something that you can't reinforce, you shouldn't be asking it. And I think I.e., give an example. Um, so we take the dog outside and we say, here, they have no check cord on them, they have no collar on them, we've had a basic understanding of what here works, and we think, let's throw them to the wolves and see if they can survive this. Here, oh, look at that, a butterfly it takes their attention that way, and now we either say here again, or here again, or here again, or here again, or get frustrated, or try and chase the puppy down or coax them back by grabbing a treat bag and shaking it. And all of these things create issues. And then finally we catch the puppy and we throw their collar on them and we say, now I'll show you. Now you're going to listen. Now you've got a collar smart dog because they feel you just taught them. This is how this works. And I would say the other side of that is the people that put the collar on the dog. Good first step. But then say, I don't even have to charge the transmitter because I never have to push the button. Well, if you never have to push the button and your collar's dead, and then you do have to push the button, then you've also set yourself up for that situation where you can't reinforce the behavior that you're asking for. So um, there's two things that we think are very, very important in training. One of which is timing. That's what I always categorize as. And I had a discussion with another trainer in this, and he... um, uh, basically pushed me, forced my hand that I have to give a number one thing. Number one thing for me in dog training is timing. That is the most important thing. The second most important thing would be consistency. And they are very, they're like neck and neck-ish, but it's it's timing and consistency. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so you know, just to add on to that, you know, for us, um, so we actually have a board in our back room, which is our training room. And uh, so I'm, if you guys have noticed that I'm really big on my boards and quotes and saying. <laughs> White boards yeah, I like everywhere. It. Yeah, I like it. Um, but uh, you know, we, our general rule that we have on that board, and it never leaves, is never give a command that you cannot reinforce. And I mean, we have to remind ourselves that each and every day, training wise. Um, I think when you get in a home situation, that increases tenfold. Um, well, it gets hard. One hundred percent. Yeah. Because so, yeah. when you're being paid to train a dog or you're training a dog for a specific task and you get them out for that training session, you can be very black and white, very consistent. But when they're part of your family and hanging out in the house, it's easy to get sloppy and not have those same level of expectation. Uh, it's, okay it's just my day. dog. It's just yeah, whatever. Um, we like to use the saying, the shoemaker's children have no shoes. Well, the dog trainer's children have no manners. Well, that's not typically the case completely, but um, we're definitely not as consistent as we probably should be. And sometimes it shows. With our personal dogs yeah, versus that's kennel what I'm dogs. Saying. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. There it has a little bit. So you are human. These things happen. It happens to all of us a little bit. Um, but definitely being able to only ask for things that you can reinforce are, is going to be the key to preventing those issues. So. Next question from Boosted Deuce One on Boosted Instagram. Deuce. I heard you say that you have some of your puppies coming back for training. If the pup is raised by the owner, then with you for a couple of months for training, do the pups remember their owners when they get picked up? Does the pup's personality change during the training? Is that original bond still there? Thank you. Love your videos. So what do you guys think? I'm sure you get this question a lot. And I'm sure you a get lot. a lot of your puppies back in for training. So Absolutely. Mm. We love when our puppies come back. That's right. It's like a little family reunion. Really. Mm-hmm. You get a post. Look at this. Two, yes. three, four, five dogs. Look at that 
brothers, sisters. Exactly. Do you want to take it or you want me to? It's up to you. Um, well, I'll give the short answer. You can give the All long right. one. Absolutely. They remember you 100%. Mm-hmm. Well, so it's funny. So I, uh, I spoke at a, uh, it was a dog trainers, you know, convention. Sure. Uh, down in Orlando, Florida. This was, this was like four or five years ago, maybe it was quite a while ago. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I was on right after, uh, an animal psychologist that they went through all their thoughts and, um, they said, and it was something, it was something crazy. Like a, a dog can't recall after it was like something like 48 hours. Right. Like, and so, you know, they can't recall, they can't have that. And, and I'm sitting there thinking, well, that's, I see this every day that that's incorrect. Right. So, uh, I got up there and whether it was right or wrong, I, I gave my opinion right away. <laughs> sure. And, uh, I said, man, I wish I could have been in that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and so, you know, for us, I mean, we have people that send dogs in not for, you know, three weeks, but for three, four, five, six, seven, eight months. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Uh, yep. now, you know, the longer is, is pretty abnormal, but in probably every, an average of three to four months of training. Yeah. 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 That, that'd be a good average. And not once have we ever had a dog take more than three seconds to remember the owners. It doesn't matter how long they are away yep. and you know, they, they lose their mind. And that's why when we bring the, the owners into you know, the fold, as far as the training you know, aspect goes, um, that first initial, uh, bit, I mean, we're not training, you know, we're kind of putting yourselves in the dog shoes, you know, and going, he is going to lose his mind. He's all full of yeah. emotion. He's going to be all over the place. This is not the time for you to go, okay, now we're going to heal, sit, come, right? You have to get that kind of out of the way. And I think the owners want and expect it, honestly, because if yeah. you would, <laughs> If you would set that dog up to be like, you're going to be a machine, you're going to sit here, you're going to be well behaved. And then the owner comes into that situation is like, oh, they're they not even excited. They don't to see even me. care that I'm here mm-hmm. and they yeah. want to see their dog love them and that they miss them and they want mm-hmm. to see them. So I think that we're doing an injustice if we have unrealistic expectations in that situation. Yeah. yeah. And, and for us, you know, we oftentimes get the comment that oh, I, I don't think they want to leave. I think mm-hmm. they love being here more than they do at home, which is, is, is what we want. Um, but one of the things that, that we talk a lot about is, um, which I'm sure you guys do the same thing. And, and I, I don't know that it's maybe common practice, you know, in, in a kennel situation, you know, maybe it is, but we try to do a lot of relationship building with the dogs because I believe that that really helps us progress forward as far as our training goes. Um, but it also, you know, creates a, a confidence and a happiness, you know, inside the kennel and inside the environment that they're now in, sure. uh, rather than just throwing them in a kennel run, taking them out for the little bit of training they have each day and putting them back in. And, uh, you know, Every time I give somebody a tour of the kennel uh, or when I bring a dog out to demonstrate, um, I always tell them, just look at the dogs. Mm -hmm. They're not going to lie to you. If they're happy, they're going to tell you they're happy. If they're not, they're going to tell you they're not. And I think that's the one thing that that people can really take comfort in, especially people that are on the fence. Uh, We get a lot of uh, um, situations that the dog was at a kennel and it was a very poor situation. Yeah. Right? A, yeah. a Unfortunately, nightmare. there are, there are a lot of those that happen. Right. Yeah. And so you know, we talked about this a little, a little bit today, Ethan, where, um, you know, you watch a dog, you know, that I ran today that was in a situation like that. And she was you know, a complete meltdown situation. And now she's confident, she's happy, she's mm-hmm. enthusiastic. And, you know, we take a lot of pride in not only, you know, reversing, you know, that type of a situation, but also, um, the, the relationship with the owner or the person, you know, think about how much extra trust that they person had to have, have to, to have try it, it again. Oh, it's, yeah, it's huge. For sure. Yeah. So, for sure. Um, that's a priority of ours for sure. Absolutely. And that's really important for us as well as building that trust and that confidence and that bond with that dog to train because they need to want to work for you if you're going to be able to accomplish anything. And very true. You look at a dog, you know, if they're happy to be there, I would say the same about dogs that come in for training anywhere from two to seven to eight months of training, uh, they remember their owners. And sometimes there's a dog or two that takes a little bit longer and they're like, wait a minute. Oh yeah. And then they smell them. And then they focused on training, focused on training. Or, you know, we have a lot of activity at the kennel where we've got other clients coming in for training sessions with their dogs and consults and, um, all that activity. So the dogs don't always recognize that when somebody comes through the door, that's their owner. It's, Oh, this is just another person coming through the door. And then when they're like, Oh wait, that's my person. And then you're right. They just, they kind of just lose lose their their (laughs) mind. Yeah. They lose their mind and get all crazy. They do their zoomies. They get all excited. 
And then we have to be like, okay, let's take this down a notch because that craziness like. is getting a little excessive. And I know that you're happy to see your dog and your dog is obviously happy to see you, but let's actually show you that they can behave because most people, yes, they love and expect that their dog will act like that with them when they just get back, but they also just paid us to have their dog trained and right. obedience is a huge part of that. So then, and most people don't want their dog to jump all over them and act like an idiot on a regular basis. Um, that's something that they came in for training to get rid of. So then we say, okay, this was our one and done. Now we need to show you how to handle your dog into the situation where they aren't going to act like an idiot and jump all over you. So, so no, the dogs do not forget you. Yes. Next question. It's a long way of saying that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Whitney started that off by saying, the short answer to that question <laughs> right. is absolutely. I'm, I'm good they don't at the long you. answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 I think yeah. she knows you pretty well because yeah. yeah. she called that one. Um, next question from Manda Christine Christiane. Uh, I don't know. Um, from Instagram, we are bringing home our eight-week-old GSP puppy in a few weeks. Exciting. Do you recommend crating him during the night? And if not, what do you recommend? I'm a big advocate for sleeping in bed with you for the rest of their life. <laughs> that is false black bear. Are you, are so, you serious? Oh. No. Oh, I was going to say. <laughs> no, I said. You might have to elaborate on that. No, uh, false no. black bear. So, no, 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 Ethan no, 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 no. Um, and I, if you ever want your puppy to be comfortable in their crate, they need to learn crate training. Even if you for, don't want them to be comfortable, like you, that's not something in the forefront of your mind that you, you need want to think a about dog. The you're future. Like, no, no, they'll just be their family members. They need to be part. But you need to think about the future and the fact that your dog will eventually, most likely, need to be crated at some point in their life, whether that's crated for transportation or if you have to board them, they may be crated or at least in a kennel run, something like that. So if you set your puppy up for, well, we always sleep in bed, then they think I that's was the norm. Teasing, folks. I know. That's the norm. That's what I look. should expect. And now you're expecting me to go in this crate. Well, that's BS and I don't want it. And they're going to fight that situation even Definitely more. Definitely makes it tougher. Whereas yeah. if from day one you set it up as this is our routine as we play, mm-hmm. we train, we do all the things. And then at night it's crate time and you have to quiet down and it has to be part of your routine. And then, I mean, our dogs don't sleep in crates for the rest of their lives, but probably for that first solid year, that's the expectation. We get out during the day, we train, we hang out, we're part of the family. We sleep in a crate overnight. A, I don't necessarily feel I can trust an under one year old dog to not chew up a pair of shoes or chew on the, you know, bed frame or, or worse something than overnight. Just, you know, having a little destruction like that, but actually ending up with something that causes a serious medical issue like a bowel mm-hmm. obstruction, a or, blockage or something because they yeah. ate, you know, your sock in the middle of the night and you didn't know it. And then yeah. that causes a problem. So typically we don't feel like we can trust a dog out overnight until they're at least a year. But then when we hit that point, We have four dogs sleep out on dog beds overnight, and then we have more than four dogs that we own personally. So So they rotate. Rotation. Mm -hmm. So this night, these dogs got to sleep out. Tomorrow night, they're going to be crated, and the other four dogs are going to be out, and it's just a rotation. So the nights that they get crated, they don't cause a fuss. The nights that they get out, they absolutely love it. But um, we're setting them up for that success and that expectation from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. I would also add that sometimes they like that smaller area. And that if you go and see it, yeah, if you go and watch a puppy and where they go and lay down, it's usually in a smaller area, smaller confined area. So it might actually help them sleep better. Absolutely. And I think that people like to humanize dogs and Mm -hmm. personify Mm -hmm. and think, well, I wouldn't want to be put in a crate and locked up all night long. So my puppy wouldn't like that either. Well, Puppies aren't people. They Mm -hmm. are descendants from wolves, which are den creatures, which like that closed, small space, dark, comfy, cozy, safe. So, um, yeah, to touch on the puppies are not people thing. That's one of my first things when dog comes in. We have to say, first, we're going to teach your dog how to be a dog. And then we can start to train them. And it's not every dog that comes in, but there are a few of them that are, believe they are way too close to the people category. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited for this next question. Awesome. From Grundy on Instagram. When did you realize that gun dog training was the job you wanted? Oh. <laughs> oh. When uh. Josh said we were starting to kennel. <laughs> <laughs> Whitney's like, okay. <laughs> right. Here we go. Sure, we can do this. Yeah. 
Uh, okay. So for me, um, I, so I, first, let me preface this. I don't believe that anybody, uh, nobody that I've ever met that is in this profession has like from, you know, early on said, this is what I want to do and had a career path to go do this. And it's really interesting. Everybody has their own little you know path, but mine was, um, Easton, who I think was it the last episode yep. we talked about? I think about we him? talked about it in the last episode. Uh, so go back and watch it if you haven't seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep, better, better make sure. That part, was a part good two, one. We all two, talked, we talked about, about our, our yeah. dog of a lifetime. So yeah. it's a well, good one. So uh, so Easton for me, um, he uh, he was you know, a dog that I had you know, young in my life. You know, probably from age you know sixteen to what twenty nine. Some, somewhere in there. Um, and so I, uh, he was, he was in a very crucial part of my life. Right. And so, um, I, as I kind of went through, uh, my career path, uh, he, he was kind of intersecting that and, um, he was extremely successful at everything that we ran in and, uh, he made, he made me enjoy it. And it was really because of him that I said, you know, I, I really, like this. I like being a part of this. I love teaching. I love reading, you know, the dogs. And, uh, from there I went and I, you know, mentored under a few different people to make sure, right. Because so wait, 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 this. you didn't just jump and you had one dog and you didn't just start your own <laughs> you business. You didn't just say I'm a professional that, dog trainer. That, that sounds like that might be a pet peeve of yours. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. No comment. Mm. Okay, mm-hmm. we'll move on. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so you know, after I uh, went through that, and I mean, it was years, of course, of doing that. Yeah. Um, you know, that's when I kind of came back and said, "This is this is a career for me." Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I actually did not know people sent their dogs away to get trained until Josh and I started dating. <laughs> Said, what? Surprise. You know, you just think about that. Honestly, I don't. I mean, before we really started working on it, I don't believe that I really put much thought in you because we had a dog growing up you know and he was just a dog she was just a dog she was a pain in the butt because we had no idea what we were doing we also had just a rescue pound dog that i wouldn't have thought twice about training Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. i taught it some little house tricks at the house that didn't really do all that well and yeah that was about it (laughs) No. So, and then you became a dog trainer and then I became a dog trainer. <laughs> it that's it. Like that's how it happens. Like that. <laughs> so, um, for me, it's, uh, it's similar. You know, like you said, it's not, I didn't start as a kid going, Hey, I want to grow up to be a dog trainer. Um, I actually started in the, uh, computer field. I was always a technology based guy. I love that aspect of things. And, um, played football and actually looked at the potential of having a career playing football, at least through the collegiate level. Um, and blew up my knee really, really bad. And it took uh, three surgeries and over a year worth of physical therapy between all of that stuff before I was back to mediocre. Being um, able to walk, walk. exercise, get around, mm-hmm. do some stuff. So that really put a damper on the whole, we're going to play football for a while thing. And I kind of turned into. Then uh, he met me. Uh, about the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And at I the met same him time, because you blew out your knee. Yeah. I was supposed to be at football camp. Instead, I went to a um, rendezvous, which rendezvous. we talked about in some of their yep, we've talked to, Yep, And I ran into this lovely lady. And uh, we'd met before, but it really gave us a lot of time to spend together. And it changed I my him. life. Yeah. So I was a uh, glorified neck beard sitting there, you know, computer in it. And... Um, uh, what? I've never even heard that saying. Really? Uh, pretty sure you just made it up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, if you have heard of a neckbeard and you know what I'm talking about, throw it in the comments below. We want to hear from you and make sure I'm not crazy. He's crazy. Um, but I moved from that to doing a lot of computer-based stuff, and that happened to move into helping the high school that I worked at for their networking department i worked for the guy as credit for school uh, for half of my day actually that was part of it um, moved to a new school took a job fixing computers for the geek squad He's drove the bug wow. and um and then i paid my way through the portion of college that i finished before i dropped out um fixing computers and that technology knowledge um kind of drove me toward what became a job i got a dog uh crazy sammy i've always been one yeah crazy mm-hmm. sammy we've talked about her before 
Um, I've always been one of those people that felt like I can do anything I set my mind to. You know, I'm a go-getter. I like, uh, yeah, I can do that, whatever. It's a dog, right? You just read everything. You learn everything. You can teach any dog to do anything if you put enough time, effort, and energy into it. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've had this conversation before. We just yeah. talked about that. And right. that but was, this was back when we knew nothing. Uh, yeah, that was the mindset that I came into. So I, I got a, the newspaper, right? I got a dog. I went there solely with the mindset of if it's not this right color, I'm not leaving without it. Lucky um, she was the right color. She happened to be the right mm-hmm. color. So I took her home and it was a complete disaster. And then I reached out. I started scouring the internet. I found nothing until I and came across. And that was back in the day when there wasn't a thousand videos on how to train yeah, your dog. Yeah, YouTube online. wasn't as big and there wasn't as much online knowledge. So I read some books and went, yeah, man, I really know not a whole lot about this. So we reached out to a professional um, and did some you know, barter business of, I could help you with some of this technology-based stuff to grow your business. If you could help me with the dog, it turned into a full-time job. And then after apprenticing for years, um, we moved out on our own to start our own kennel. What he said. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, mean, we were married, so I was kind of along for the ride at that point in our lives. And well, along for the ride, but also separate. So I'll add my little two cents into this story. So um, got the opportunity for that to turn into a full-time gig. So that's where Ethan's story kind of left off. Well, for that to happen, we had to leave North Dakota, which is where we were living and where we'd gone to school at UND. Fighting Sioux, not whatever they're called hey, now. Sue, Sue. Um, and <laughs> so I was working at Sam's Club in the business office. So I was taking care of deposits and things like that. And so the fighting hawks. I think, is that what they're doing? Yeah, they're the, mm-hmm. they're the fighting hawks. Interesting. Anyway, so Ethan moved to do this in Minnesota. I'm stuck in North Dakota. So I'm like, how do I get out of North Dakota to be with Ethan? The way I did that was take a job at Walmart. Oh my God. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Gives it gives you a lot of imagine. respect for the people that put up with wow. that. Yes, every like people, and I have a lot of respect for the people that have to deal with the people. Because there are so many rude people that shop at Walmart and they take everything out on the poor cashiers and the poor customer service managers that truly have no control over how many registers are open. I digress. But anyway, so I worked there for a while. It was very difficult. And I was basically biding my time going, what can I do until there's another position that opens up at the kennel that Ethan's working at? Because I have always loved animals, loved dogs. We had our own short hair. I saw what he was getting to do on a daily basis. And I was like, I want to do that too. But small businesses don't always have a million positions to fill. So I kind of had to wait until something became available. And then I was also able to start that apprenticeship and start learning a little bit more hands-on, not just living vicariously through Ethan and his dog training experiences. So then when that became an option, then I took it. And then, again, we, we did that for a few years and then ventured out on our own. For sure. So those are my two cents. We got uh, another one or two short uh-huh. ones. Uh, yes, this is a good one from Leah Phi on Facebook. We're finally getting to some Facebook ones, so don't feel left out, Facebook. Do you recommend e-collar training for non-hunting GSPs? We plan to mush, kick sledding, ski joring, bike joring, and cane across nice. with our dog and also want a very well-trained family dog, so not sure if this is something we should pursue. Short answer, yes. Mm-hmm. The collar conditioning, like we talked about in... Does it need a long answer? Watch part one and two. That's what I was just going to say. Collar conditioning. Yep. 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 Yes, yes, yes. So absolutely, yes. Watch part one, two, and you'll see what our answers were and how important collar conditioning and properly collar conditioning your dog is. Yep. Next question from Facebook. Krista Warender Masters. We just got our first GSP pup last week. Congratulations. We started clicker training the second day and it's going well. She knows her name. Here and sit. Question, should the same person do the training or can we mix it up? We have three girls, ages 12 and 9, and nine-year-old twins. Awesome. Oh, congratulations. That really want to help. Thanks. Yeah, I thought you said nine-month-old. I was So congratulations happened a while ago, but uh, congratulations nonetheless. I think that sounds like a great question to head out on. So uh, I want to go, I want to hear you guys' part on uh, how much of the family should be included in a new puppy's training? I would say everyone. Hmm. I think it's important that the puppy knows that everyone is in charge. 
Yeah, you know, the the whole family has to be involved because the whole family is naturally going to be involved in the dog's life, right? For sure. And that dog is going to again naturally, you know, find its its packing order. And if the fa- whole family isn't involved and consistent, yep. and uh, you know, delivers you know the the correct you know message at the right time, um, there's going to be some frustrations and issues that, that come up with that. Yeah, and the dog's not going to respect the other people hmm? that building that bond and doing those training sessions is going to build that trust, but also that respect for your daughters, which two nine-year-olds and a 12-year-old are definitely old enough to be involved in training sessions. Obviously, if we're talking about everyone becoming involved and I've got Aiden, who's only 17 months old right now, he's only able to do so much. Right now, he he can carry the bowl across the floor (laughs) without dumping the food on the ground. 90% but. 90% of the time, C still dumps it sometimes. Yeah. You know, so he is only physically and mentally at this point able to be involved so much. But our hope and goal is for him to become more involved as he becomes able. So with those constraints in mind, yes, everyone should be part of the family's training sessions and guide your children on how to properly interact with your puppy and be a part of that. So I think we can all um, go to say across the board, Everybody has to be involved. And uh, you mentioned, I believe you said, uh, pecking order. Is that? Yep. So um, I think the biggest misconception that I can throw out here is the last little caveat to this question. Um, uh, And we see this more from, not to pick on, but wives and children that I feel like if I give them all of the love, which is love the way that we see love, you know, petting and praise and sweet talk and cuddling and those kind of things. I give them all of that. They should also, you know, return the favor, which um, dog's brains don't work that way. And the reason that the dog only typically responds to dad or whoever, usually it's one person, is it's typically the person that puts the most time, effort, and energy into the training portion. So there's respect there. Um, and, And if everybody can help and be part of that training, that respect can be evenly distributed amongst the family. Yeah, for yep. sure. Totally agree. Awesome. Guys, I want to say thank you so much for joining us this week. Thank you. You bet. Awesome. It was great to have a little bit different perspective. Also from a couple that owns and operates mm-hmm. their own kennel business and breeds their own dogs, labs. Mm-hmm. And it was great to see that different perspective on some of the questions, but also go, wow, we have a lot in alignment with these questions and answers. So, Which I, you know, I do think that this is super cool and just like taking a second to reflect on this is that, you know, there's not many, like the four of us are in a very unique, you know, class as far as not only our age, you know, and the success that we've all been very fortunate enough to have, but then also to do it with your spouse, I think in any profession (laughs) uh, is, is certainly a feat. But, uh, a lot of people look at us and go, you guys are crazy. Right. Yeah. Right. But yeah, it's, it, it's, I think it's really neat and it's something that I'm, I know I'm going to enjoy kind of keeping up on things as we all, you know, progress forward in our careers. For sure. And 100%. we, and we have children. I mean, That's yes, right. throw that into the mix because Ava is just over a year now a and year. eight and 17 months and they got a little bit of playtime together today, which yep. they both enjoyed. So it is, it's really cool to see how you guys have been successful, what you've done to become successful and vice versa. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey guys, thank you again for all of the questions this week. We really appreciate everybody reaching out with their questions. And I do want to say, if we didn't get to your question this week, um, we do have a community set up for question and answer that happens daily. Uh, either Kat or I go on and we answer questions on, if you check out patreon.com slash standing stone kennels, you can go on there. It is a subscription service, but it is set up to answer your questions when you have them. So, so if you've got a question that you're dying to get an answer to, and we haven't been able to get to it, check us out there. If not, uh, guys, I am, oh, here we go, (laughs) out of bourbon, and uh, we are out of time for this week. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and we will catch you next time.